In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are continuing in our series, Identity, God's Design for Sexuality. And this morning, I would like to invite you to take out your Bibles, if you have them, to Romans chapter 1. We're going to go to an important passage of Scripture that relates to some of the subject matter that we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You can see the words there on your screen. We once again want to welcome those of you that are uh, tuning in online and just let you know we are thankful that you've joined with us here today. Romans chapter 1, I'm just going to read verses 24 through 27 right now, but we will talk about a number of other uh, verses here in this chapter a little bit later. Romans chapter 1, verse 24 says this, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Once again, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have to seek you through your word. We ask that by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us today, that we would not only know the truth, but we would obey. And I pray, Lord, that you would posture our hearts today that we can share your love with those around us. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your spirit. Holy Spirit, would you minister to people today? I pray that today would be a bad day for the devil. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, it doesn't take uh, much uh, for us to realize that uh, we live today in the land of confusion. Uh, People today are confused about gender, identity, and sexuality, uh, really in ways that are unprecedented in America. Uh, I've seen actually in the last 10 to 15 years in particular, this confusion that has taken over our cities, our businesses, our grad schools, universities, grade schools, and yes, uh, even sadly, our churches. Indeed, a queer thing has happened to America. Uh, We have books these days for preschoolers that are also read in schools, like, Oh, the Things Mommies Can Do, or What Could Be Better Than Two, Two Daddies and Me, Daddy, Papa, and Me, Mama, Mama, and Me, and a Tango Makes Three. And these kind of things are being read to our children in these schools today. We have things like Pride Month, celebrated in businesses and restaurants around this country where rainbow flags flow year-round in storefront windows, hotels posting online that they are gay-friendly. You know, corporate America will embrace every aspect of non-heterosexuality, include bisexuality, transgenderism, and beyond, calling for the dismissal of those who refuse to follow suit. And religious groups will no longer be allowed to view homosexual practice as immoral, branding such opposition as hate speech. You know, it's interesting, writing in 2014, Mark Engler and Peter Engler wrote, it can be difficult to remember how hostile the terrain was for the LGBTQ plus advocates in even recent years. As of 1990, three quarters of Americans saw homosexual practice as immoral. Less than a third condoned same-sex marriage, something no country in the world permitted. In 1996, the Defense of Marriage Act, which defined marriage as a union between a man and a woman and denied federal benefits to same-sex couples, passed by an overwhelming 85 to 14 margin in the U.S. Senate. However, today, these seem like scenes from an alternate universe. What is striking is not just the the seeming suddenness of this reversal, but the rapidly expanding victory of how social change happens. You know, it's interesting, back in 2008, when then-Senator Barack Obama stated, I believe marriage is the union between one man and one woman. 
And as a Christian, it is also a sacred union. That same year, he even said to a a pro-gay MTV audience, I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. I'm not in favor of gay marriage. Boy, what a difference a few years make as we see what was posted there in the White House in the picture with the rainbow. You know, our society has indeed been dramatically changed in recent years. And it has actually been a complex, multifaceted movement away from God and His holy ways. You can say that since the sexual revolution of the 1960s, major changes have taken place in our culture. We have, first of all, the public's perception of homosexuality and same-sex relationships. We also see the educational system's embrace of homosexuality. We see also the legislative decisions recognizing gays and lesbians as a distinct group of people within our society equivalent to other ethnic groups. We see the media's portrayal of the LGBTQ plus movement. And as I mentioned, we've seen corporate America's welcoming of what was once considered unacceptable behavior. You might ask, well, have we lost the culture? Well, that actually implies that there was a time when we as Christians had the culture. And yes, it is true that America has been founded upon Judeo-Christian principles, but sin has devastated our nation over the years. And in recent years, and in many ways, we have lost our conscience. Have we lost our culture? Well, I would say that we've lost our shame. How did we get here? Well, that's really the point and the question I want to ask this morning. How did we get to where we are at today in our culture in America based on some of the things that I've seen? I've just given you a very, very small sample size of some of the things that are transpiring. But you see this stuff and you know what's going on in the social media and the news and elsewhere. But how do we get here? Well, Romans 1 has a lot to say to us. It actually gives some remarkable insight Uh, Interestingly enough, it was written centuries ago, but yet it contains God's timeless truths that are still so absolutely relevant. You know, the arguments here in Romans chapter 1 are really held together by the interplay of two revelations. First of all, we have the righteousness of God as revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then also we see the wrath of God revealed through God's punishment of ungodliness and unrighteousness. So both revelations Uh, Both God's righteousness and the wrath of God depends upon knowledge. We can't be saved without the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And likewise, we can't be judged except that we have some knowledge of God through the created world that we see around us. That God is fair in how he conducts himself with humanity. And it's interestingly uh, enough that that same-sex relationships are singled out here in this chapter as Paul sees this as a vivid image of humanity's primal rejection of God and His ways. So how do we get to where we are here in America today? Well, it's really the same thing that Paul describes here in Romans chapter 1. The first thing that we see in this chapter is the suppression of truth. Look with me once again at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So we see, first of all, the suppression of truth. Not only this was going on in Paul's day, it is going on today as well. The God has revealed himself in nature, in his creation, in this world. He's revealed himself in the complementary of male and female as well. You know, it's interesting that the term that is used here literally means to hold down the truth and to repress it. You know, when I was a kid during the summer, uh, we, our, a couple of our neighbors had swimming pools and me and my brothers would go over there and we would kind of rough house in the pool and, uh, you know, try dunking each other. And, it, you know, it's one thing to dunk, uh, you, you know, your sibling and try to get them under the water. It's another thing to try to drown them, to keep them down underneath so that you'd actually kill them. We didn't do that. We were just dunking and having fun with horseplay. 
Well, the, the idea here of this term suppression of the truth means that the that the cultures literally tried to drown out truth not just dunk it not just try to get it out but to to, to remove it from the world that we see around us but it's interesting that paul says very clearly in verse 20 that no person is without excuse In other words, that we can look at creation and arrive at the conclusion that there must be a creator. Look with me, if you will, you'll see on the screen Psalm 19. This is a passage that makes it very clear that God has made himself known in his creation. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. So creation itself testifies to the existence of God. Now, our culture in recent decades and over the last maybe 150 years, we've sought to drown out that reality or or to dunk it, to get it it removed and to drown it out of our thinking. But again, there's been a suppression of truth. And we see a lot of what is going on in our culture today because of an attempt to remove truth from the discussion. The second thing that we have to understand about how we as America has gotten there, same as it was in Paul's day, is the futility of thinking, the futility of thought. Look in verse 21, once again of Romans chapter 1. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So there's a confusion of mind that people have become foolish in their thinking. Incidentally, when you remove God and when you remove any sense of standard, you you have no mooring for your thoughts. And because God is rejected, people become futile in their thinking. And as a result, there's a significant proliferation of confusion. And that is indeed true of what is going on in America Now, a question we have to ask, which is an important question along this line of futility of thought, are what are the philosophical underpinnings of the movement that we see around us? How have we become futile in our thinking? At this point, I I do want to recommend a book. It's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. It is a very heavy read, but it's an important read on how we got here to where we are today. And it's interesting that Truman suggests several schools of thought have contributed to the philosophical uh, degeneration we have seen in our Western culture and how the cultural battles have played out collectively and individually. The first person is Sigmund Freud. This is the first man that he argues that Freud, more than any other figure, made plausible the idea that humans, from infancy onward, are are at its core sexual beings. That it is our sexual desires that are ultimately decisive in who we are. And this belief has shaped a lot of our culture's theory of civilization. And as a result, what we have is the elevation of the psychological self. The reality is therefore inward and psychological, not outward and natural. Thinking, remember that book by John Milton called Paradise Lost. He says, the mind has its own place. And we also see the rise of emotivism as a social theory in our country. And this is the doctrine that elevates judgments and more specifically all moral judgments as nothing but expressions of preference, expressions of attitudes of feelings insofar that they are are moral or evaluate the character. So if I feel it, it must be true. If I feel it, It must be true. And so emotivism explains why the other side is wrong. And as a result, we have seen in our culture a rise in expressive individualism. So Freud is an important figure in America's cultural history because he has shaped largely this 
futile thinking that we at our core are sexual beings, which is not true. Though sexuality plays an important factor, we need to understand who God has made us in our design by Him and who we are. The next figure that is an important person in our history, or at least in our thinking of, uh, philosophically, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And he argues that all human acts, uh, every human being acts in accordance with his nature. That human corruption isn't innate, but it's something created and fostered by social conditions. That our sins are society's fault, not something that comes from within us. That we're good at birth, but perverted by external forces. And for Rousseau, the individual is at his best, and he is truly most himself as he should be when he acts in accordance with his own nature. And so we as America have adopted the be true to yourself type of slogan. And as a result of our, our, our psychological essence means that a person can or think they can make and remake their personal identity at will. Some people call this the plastic person type of thing, that you can reshape and reform your identity however you want. So Rousseau is an important figure, and Truman makes the case in his book that this is indeed true. And the final person that plays into this is Karl Marx. He essentially makes all intentional human activity political. Everything from religious organization to the structure of the family is politicized. There is no private, pre-political space in Marx's world. And that is where we are today where everything is politicized, from kindergartens to Girl Scout troops to adoption agencies to sports teams and pop music. Carl Truman summarizes these philosophical streams of thought together when he says this. Listen carefully. The self must first be psycho psychologized, and psychology must then be sexualized, and then sex must be politicized. And that is where we are in America today. I've given you just a very surface explanation of how we've gotten uh, to where we are today. Uh, if you want to do a deeper dive, I encourage you to check out that book. But again, this is all under the umbrella of futile in their thinking. So returning once again to Romans chapter 1, we see that when humanity begins down this road the wrong way, there's the suppression of truth, first of all. Secondly, there's a futility of thought, which inevitably leads to number three, idolatry. Idolatry. Look once again in Romans chapter 1, verse 23. It says this. Uh, let me actually skip back to 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the moral, mortal God for images of resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So there is a type of an unholy exchange that people want to worship everything but God. There's wrong allegiances. Now, I want to make it very clear, and we see in Scripture time and time again, that idolatry is a serious sin before God. Turn with me, if you will, and again, you'll see the words on your screen, to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 reveals to us the Ten Commandments. In verses 2 through 5, listen what the Lord says. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them and serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, a lot of times when we read particularly a commandment that says don't make carved images and we think, okay, you know, that's something that they did in ancient times and pagan times and they might do it some, in some other places around this world, but, you know, we don't see this largely going on in America. 
You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I find interesting is when you bring up this discussion related to these matters of LGBTQ plus discussions, or you have this idea that you know, people will say, well, my God would never be like that. He would never judge people that way. My God would not be this way. I believe when people often reference my God, that's a symbol of idolatry it's because they're making a, a God to suit themselves. He's not the true God, but he's my God, how I want him to be, and he acquiesces to whatever I desire. And so when people say my God would never be, you're right, that's your God, that's not the true God. You, you've worshipped your own God that you've made in your mind. You might not have carved a literal you know, wooden image there, but you've carved a God in your own mind that isn't the real God. And so you are guilty of breaking one of these Ten Commandments, and God is a jealous God, as he makes very clear. And when we hear that God is a jealous God, we mean that God it desires people to himself. He desires that we worship him, and he, he, doesn't, he doesn't want us to put up with idolatry. Be wary and be concerned, even in your own self, if you've created a God in your own mind that puts up with sin. We have to come to a place where we say, God, I have to confess that I'm not worshiping you, the true God. I've worshiped a God that I've set up in my own mind that it condones sin. We do this. We do this in our culture all over the place, and there are many churches across this country that have adopted that standpoint. You know, Paul's mind here, same-sex sexual intimacy, and is, is an especially clear illustration of the idolatrous human impulse to turn away from God's order and his creation and design. And so both idolatry and homosexuality are denials of natural revelation. And actually, Romans chapter 1 is the most obvious condemnation of homosexuality in Scripture. And we're going to talk about how some people would argue in the weeks ahead against some of these passages in order to condone uh, their behavior. But it goes back to what I just said. We've created a God to suit ourselves. And so here, Paul, and this is another important point to make, Paul is not describing merely individual actions, and it does include that, but the corporate rebellion of humanity against God. So we see within our culture, we see in, in the world around us, we see in Paul's day, there's a corporate, a, a collective rebellion against God and His ways, because when you remove God, you become futile in your thinking. And you begin to worship other things other than Him. And look what happens in verse 24. It says that therefore God has given them over to their lust. Verse 24 says this, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. He mentions in verse 26, he uses the language dishonorable passions, contrary to nature. In other words, that there's a divine design to manhood and womanhood that should not be transgressed. The homosexual practice is sinful because it violates God's design in creation. He mentions verse 27, shameless acts. Verse 28, debased minds. Verse 29, filled with unrighteousness. What, what is this? Really, basically, at its fundamental level, it's a rejection against God, it's a rejection against truth, and it's a rejection against His creation. What was true in Paul's day, sadly and tragically, is being played out in American culture today. You know, it's interesting, in his farewell address to the nation, George Washington asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation to desert the oaths, which are the instrument, instruments of investigation in courts of justice? Washington continued by declaring that morality cannot be maintained without religion. And where there's no fear of God, the sanctity of oaths and vows, and ultimately the foundation of society, is destroyed. He's right. Many today have forgotten God's standard, and they have rebelled against Him. And what we're seeing in our culture today is merely, is merely a result of this rebellion. 
I want to say also something very clearly. Homosexuality is not celebrated in today's culture due to increased um, immoral tolerance. Rather, it's celebrated due to a decrease in sexual morality. We've rebelled against God and His ways. And you can say what Paul says here, that this is really the Romans' road in the wrong direction. This is the opposite of what God has designed. You know, we've, I'll explain a little bit later in the service what the Romans' road is in the right direction. Some of you that maybe are a little older have heard that language of how you share your faith with other people. You take the, them down the Romans' road and you go verse by verse and explain the gospel. And I'll do that here in a few moments. But we, what we see here in Romans chapter 1 is the Romans' road in the completely opposite direction. Erwin Lutzer said it this way, Progress in the wrong direction is not something to celebrate especially when it goes against the natural order of creation or even in the established facts of science. And so, Clayhouse, we as Christians need to take a stand. We need to take a sound biblical stand for God's holy standards. Amen to that? Now, how can we be, as Christians, intellectually tolerant of opinions and ideas that we know to be false or actions that we know to be evil? How can we do this? I mean, to, to really to remain silent and inactive when error or evil is being canvassed has very serious consequences. In other words, we cannot have a laissez-faire attitude regarding these matters. You know, one of the gravest examples of Christian laissez-faire is the failure of the German churches to speak out against the Nazi treatment of the Jews back in the 1930s and 40s. Only a, a few brave Christian voices spoke up and raised in protest against that evil. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others. The, the, the evangelical church there never spoke out against the Aryan legislation by the Nazis. And Bonhoeffer himself was deeply upset by the church's silence and frequently quoted Proverbs 31.8, Open thy mouth for the dumb. Friends, I want to make something very clear. Tolerance isn't always a virtue, especially when confronted with evil and sin. We must not be silent. This anything-goes mentality in our culture has caused many Christians to hold back when we should have the opportunity to stand up for truth and what Scripture says. You know, we, we are vilified by our culture, and, and we fear, perhaps many of us fear, as being labeled homophobic. You know, to today we actually live in an I'm offended phenomenon. You know, Hillary Morgan Fair, in her book, Mama Bear Apologetics, says people have swallowed the lie that because they can't control their feelings, then the outside world must conform to their feelings. You know, our culture is attempting to marginalize Christianity as extremists. And those who oppose the LGBTQ plus agenda are vilified, which can and is actually happening now. It's leading to criminalization, which can end in true persecution. What's ironic here is that free speech is what many gay activists grant themselves, but not to others. They seek uncontested cultural dominance. In fact, any restrictions on their rights is taken to be motivated by hate. Yes, I want to make something very clear, and we're going to talk about this because this is a deeply personal subject matter for many, many of us here today. We as Christians are called to love people. No exceptions. We're called to love people with the love of Jesus, but we must uphold truth and righteousness. In fact, to not do that, in my opinion, is not loving them as we should. Calling people redemptively to the foot of the cross. I'm not just trying to single out one sin, it's all sin. Calling people to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And we're going to talk more specifically in the weeks ahead about how we can do this specifically in our culture. What I've been doing here these last few weeks is laying really a foundation or a groundwork, and we're going to kind of get into some of the weeds as we come in uh, in the weeks ahead. And I just also want to make something very clear. I know we have the fall festival coming up on uh, this Saturday, and I thought, well, are we, we get a bunch of guests, you know, are they going to just you know, jump in the deep end with us. What we're going to do next Sunday is we're going to take a one-week break and we're, we're going to talk about the authority of Scripture and why, believe, why we believe the Bible is true for every facet of our lives. And that will provide, hopefully, an on-ramp for people as we continue in this series to say, you know what, because we believe the Bible is true, this is what the Bible has to say about how we conduct ourselves sexually and in every other area. So just give you a little heads up of where we're going to go next week. We'll take a one-week break, though that one sermon will buttress what we're already talking about so that we're able to pick up where we left off here in two weeks. But we as Christians cannot compromise. All of us have been touched very deeply by what is going on in our culture today. We have friends and family who identify as gay or lesbian or transgender And we struggle with knowing how to respond. Yes, love is critical, but we can't compromise truth, friends. And so we need God's wisdom in how we conduct ourselves and posture ourselves with our family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and also the world around us. And we're going to take some extended time to talk specifically on that subject matter. But I do want to highlight one last verse found in chapter 1 of Romans, verse 32. The very last verse of the chapter says this, Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. What this verse is, is it provides for us a serious indictment that God's word levies against individuals and churches that give approval to those who practice these things. My friends, churches have no right to approve what God has condemned. And there can be no assimilation between God's holy standards and approving and practicing immorality. Whether you're talking about homosexuality or heterosexual sexual immoral behavior or any type of behavior. So we're in a quintessential clash. And the clash, my friends, isn't with people, it's with darkness. It's with evil. It's with lies that have taken people captive. We need to hear that. You know, Michael Brown said it this way, let's stand with God and His Word and confront the culture with His redemptive love rather than trying to conform God and His Word to the culture. This is always the path of wisdom in life. You know, I mentioned earlier that we are seeing people traverse the Romans road in the wrong direction. What is the Romans road in the right direction? You might want to write some of these references down. This might actually help in your witnessing to people as you're wanting to share the truth and the gospel with others. Just some some verses in Romans that give a a basic outline of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Friends, we're not here to thump everybody else and say the world's going to hell in a handbasket. We need to start with ourselves. We need to say, God, is there anything in me that is impure? Am I walking and living in any type of sin that is against your holy standard? Scripture says that all of us have sinned. There's no one that does good, not even one. That we've all fallen short of God's perfection and His standard. Romans 5.8 says, But God showed His love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, for all all these other religions, it's what you got to do to achieve salvation. What we see in Christianity is what Jesus has done for us. It is His work. It's not us trying to muster up a bunch of good works to try to let the good works outweigh the bad. No, Scripture makes it very clear, as we see in the Romans road here, that none of us could ever please God because of our activity. We've all sinned. And so we needed somebody to rescue us. And God did that by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world who lived a perfect life, who submitted Himself to the cross, died for our sins and in our stead. 
And He died, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that we could be in right standing with God by faith as we repent and believe in Him. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That Jesus is the only way. There's, it's not Jesus plus something else. It's not other paths, you know, kind of this philosophy, well, all paths make it to the top of the mountain. No, there's only one way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. My friend, you should never seek any other pathway other than Jesus. He is the only way. How can be, you say, well, how can God be so narrow-minded that He would provide only one way? Well, I'm so thankful that God's open-minded that He would provide one way for us. That He would provide a way of salvation, a way of escape through what Christ has done for us. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. What a promise. You can take this to the bank. You can cash it. If you confess with your mouth, if you declare and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised Him from the dead, that He didn't stay on the cross. That's why I don't like seeing crucifix with Jesus still hanging there because He's risen. He said, you will be saved. Finally, Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to just invite you to stand this time as we close. I want to just ask you a question. We've been talking about this Roman road. The question I have for you is which direction are you traveling? Which direction are you traveling? And you say, well, I'm not involved. Maybe, maybe you've been involved in some of this stuff. Maybe you're not, but you know you've been walking away from God in your attitudes towards other people, in your rebellion towards others and towards God and His ways. Jesus is saying, come home. Come home. Like the the father of the, the prodigal son, God is extending His arms to you and He's saying, come home, my son, my daughter. I want to welcome you home. Welcome you back. Would you repent? Would you believe in Jesus? Lord, we come before you now. And we confess that we've all journeyed far from you. We've all taken the Romans road in the wrong direction. But God, you provided a way. A way of escape, a way of hope, a way of redemption a way of healing, a way of forgiveness. Father, I pray for that person even now today that is wrestling with these matters. Holy Spirit, would you go after them? And would you draw them to the foot of Jesus and the cross today? Lord, we need you. Lord, would you make us into the men and women you intend us to be, not just so that we would be healed, but that also we would be agents of healing to the culture around us through you. That when they see us, they wouldn't see people that are hypocritical, but people that are leaning into you and have your heart. Father, we praise you today. We thank you for who you are, and we worship you today, Jesus, for coming to our rescue. God, would you be praised Would you be honored in us and through us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.